Good afternoon, New York, and the rest of our listeners around the globe. My name is June Stoyer, and I'm the host of the Organic Tea Radio Show. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Zoom, and you can also visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. If you'd like to be on the show or would like to find out about sponsorship opportunities, please contact us at questions at theorganicview.com. Today's show is sponsored by coronatools.com, the nation's leader in garden and landscaping tools. Listeners of The Organic View can receive 20% off their coronatools.com purchase by using the coupon code ORGVIEW. That's O-R-G-V-I-E-W. For more promotional offers, please visit our website at www.theorganicview.com. And don't forget to check out our contest section. Are small steps in the right direction enough? Over the last decade since we've been doing this show, we've talked to so many scientists, discussed mounds of research, and the bottom line is always the same. Neonicotinoids are the most toxic chemical to lower life forms on the market. The fact that they are widely used and the most profitable for industry is equally concerning. On today's show, Tom and I are going to talk about some disturbing statistics about neonicotinoids. So I'd like to welcome to the show my co-host, Colorado beekeeper, Mr. Tom Theobald. Hello, Tom. Hello, June. From snowy Colorado, we've had uh, some significant snow down here and below zero nights. So I'm snuggled into the house with the wood stove going and I'm prepared to talk. Well, hopefully people are prepared to listen. All kidding yes, aside. I'm... This is actually the type of conversation that I think more and more people should have. And it pertains to this ongoing battle to not only educate the public, but also to get the science out so that industry can stop profiting from the demise of so many species, not to mention the inevitable human impact that will take place as far as we're concerned, especially since these lower life forms are the indicator species. What's interesting is that EPA sent out an email blast in regards to their pesticide program. And what they're suggesting is a reduced residue chemistry data requirement for seed treatment uses. And the bottom line is they want to reduce the number of field trials that are used to register these seed treatments. And they're trying to push through this new approach that they say will help the manufacturers and EPA determine what that process should be. So it's, it's kind of interesting that once again, this is basically reiterating something that you've been saying for such a long time, which is that EPA has become nothing more than the marketing arm for industry. You know, it comes as no surprise to anyone who's been paying attention to what's going on. And it's just as you said, June, they're in the service of industry and and their pattern is to try to confuse things, answer old questions that should have been answered long ago, and remove anything that's an inconvenience to the chemical companies. The chemical companies recognized long ago that they needed the EPA. They needed the EPA to register their products, to endorse their products, and then to run interference for those products when the problems began to appear. So they began corrupting the management level of the EPA long ago. And uh, it's very unfortunate because the basic charter of the EPA is to, to protect the people and the environment from unreasonable risk. And the EPA is doing just the opposite of that. They're doing everything they can in service of the chemical industry at the expense of both the environment and the people. And I've said it before, and I'll continue to say it, there are many of these people who don't belong behind a desk. They belong behind bars. Let's talk about the statistics that prove exactly what you're saying. Let's begin by talking about neonicotinoids and water. Just how ubiquitous are these chemicals, Tom? Well, I was sent a a synopsis of a a wide variety of studies which 
evaluated the presence of imidacloprid, which was the first neonicotinoid, and various forms of water, both running water and groundwater and storage water and wastewater. And it's really a very con condemning story, and it covers a period of about the past 15 years. And to get back to what the EPA is proposing is to reduce the restrictions. The restrictions on uh, the neonicotinoids in the pollen, for example, uh, are unreasonably high, in the, usually in the 100 parts per billion or higher. And it seems from the science, as we understand it, that 10 parts per billion would be more reasonable. And even at that, low level, because of the dose-time ratio that we've talked about before. And that's a the, study that's never been negated either. No, and they don't, the industry doesn't want to talk about that because they don't really have a defense for that. They don't want to t discuss that element. But what that says is that because the effect on the synapses is virtually cumulative and ir irreversible, that all you have to do is add the element of time and you produce the same endpoint, which is death. So let's assume that 10 parts per billion would be a more reasonable figure to work from. What's been found all over the world, both in the United States and in other countries, are astoundingly high levels of these neonicotinoids. In this case, it was imidacloprid. And let me just start with some of the worst. In the Netherlands, where the neonicotinoids are used extensively in bulb production and the rest of their agriculture. In nursery water, in nursery water reservoirs, they found the uh, imidacloprid. <laughs> I, I, I laugh, but I'm sad. The level was 27,000 nanograms per liter. That, I believe, nanograms per liter is equivalent to parts per billion. So instead of what I was saying the reasonable limit should be 10 parts per billion, this is 27,000 parts per billion. Uh, a golf course pond, 25,000 parts per billion. And uh, <clears throat> there was some information in here in uh, on California, California urban water. 2014-2015, uh, 73% of the samples that they took were higher than 50 parts per billion. Wastewater, this is water that's come through waste treatment plants, 2015, imidacloprid at between 58 and 300 and 10 parts per billion. And that wastewater largely goes into the San Francisco Bay. Everything drinks. Everything utilizes these water sources. And these neonicotinoids are being found wherever we've looked. This is a massive poisoning of the environment. I'd like to make my correction about my statements about nanogram per liter. Actually, it takes a uh, a thousand nanograms per liter to equal one part per billion. So you have to divide everything I said by a thousand. It's they're still astounding statistics, but I was off. I was thinking of a microgram per liter, which is one part per billion. Sorry about that, folks. Not perfect. Can you talk about some of the statistics that you've collected that pertain especially to the United States, especially areas like New York, more specifically, even Long Island? There was a lawsuit several years ago in which Syngenta settled. I think they doled out um, about $10 million or so, and that's really that's really nothing compared to the damage that they've inflicted upon the ecosystem, not to mention the different species. Long Island is interesting because Long Island was on top of these problems fairly early on. And 
there was there was some concern about water well contamination on Long Island in some of the more affluent uh, parts of Long Island. So the state got involved, and from 2000 to 2011, they uh, had 179 sites that they were uh, testing. What they found, and, and remember, I said that 10 parts per billion would be a somewhat reasonable limit, okay? In catchment basins, they found the neonicotinoids at 800 to 1300 nanograms per liter, parts per billion. In private wells, between 230 and 450 parts per billion. So what uh, New York did is it did what Maryland has done just recently. It made a metacloprid, which is the one that they were looking at, a controlled use substance, which means that you have to go through the formality of taking a test in order to be able to use it. The next neonicotinoid to come along was clothianidin, and the state of New York declined to even register it. So New York has been in on this fair, since fairly early on. And as dramatic as these steps are, they really still are inadequate to control the environmental poisoning. And uh, hopefully we'll get to that a little more in a minute or two. I just want you to go back to what you said about private wells. How many wells exactly did they survey? Do you have any idea? Or is this what they reported upon? They said that, uh, and, and I just saw the summary, so I haven't read every one of these papers, but what they apparently had was between 2000 and 2011, they had 179 sites that they were sampling. Now, I don't know how many of those were catchment basins and how many were uh, private wells, but those were the statistics. Because Long Island, for the most part, the residents of Long Island get their water from aquifers. And it's interesting that they're studying or they've included in this study private wells. That's dangerous. Well, I think the residents recognize that, and that's why they raised the issues that they did. And many of the, these people were probably wealthy and influential, and they didn't want that stuff in their well water. They recognized that uh, they're pumping out of an aquifer. Long Island is sand, you know, it's a substrate of sand, so there's lots of water. And they recognized what the dangers were, and they raised their concerns. And because these were influential people, the state responded. And it makes you wonder, what about the areas where people don't have money, where industry is dumping and nobody's noticing? However, the number of health issues is on the rise. And that was actually the subject of a number of interviews that I did on The Organic View several years back. There was one specifically called The Sacrifice Zones, and that addressed this very topic. So that's a very interesting interview for those of you that are interested in learning about that very topic. Your question, June, about what about the rest of the people with respect to New York State is excellent because the likelihood is that the rest of the people and the rest of the environment is being exposed to this at levels unknown. Uh, The most recent study that we've seen from the uh, U.S. Geological Survey of the Great Lakes drainages found the neonicotinoids uh, in the majority of the samples that they took of the river systems that drained into the Great Lakes, uh, some of those were at uh, acutely toxic levels. Others were at levels which could be chronically toxic. In other words, if you administer this over a, a sufficient length of time, you're still killing an insect or a pollinator or all manner of things that we know nothing about. These these chemicals are making billions for the chemical companies 
And the reason they're making billions is because the billions of dollars in environmental damage that they cause are going unaccounted for. Well, Tom, I want to point out one thing in regards to the amount of product that they're selling. Industry could sell a certain amount that would definitely kill any predators to that particular plant. However, the fact that they have to go overboard basically is an indication of nothing other than greed. It's one thing to provide a sufficient amount so that it gets the job done, but what they're doing is basically blatantly dumping these chemicals, which they're making a huge profit to begin with, but overdoing it specifically just to make more and more profit. It's really a very, very disturbing reality when you think about what is happening here. Well, this isn't agronomy. This is marketing, and and it's a power struggle as well. It's driven by greed, and what these chemical companies want to do under the guise of feeding the world is they want to capture the farmers. They want the farmers to become dependent upon them for the source of their seed, the source of their herbicide, the source of their chemicals. And uh, a friend uh, a couple of years ago, I thought, characterized that very nicely. What she said was, the farmers have become just workers on the factory floor. And that's pretty much sums it up. And that's what the chemical companies and these large corporations want. They want the farmers, the farm economy, to be serfs to their interests. And they're well, that's what they've pretty become. well accomplishing it. They have done that because when people are that are unaware of what the industry is like, for the farmers, it's very difficult, especially when they want to sell the crop. When they're trying to do business and sell the crops that they've grown – there aren't a lot of options. They basically have to go with the people that are looking to buy the products that they have available. And it is a very tight knit circle. Yes. Interestingly, this ties into some information in regards to the industry that pertains to the sale of the genetically modified seeds market. The information that we came across is from a marketing firm, and towards the middle of the information, it says, based on trait, the global genetically modified seeds market is segmented into two parts, insect tolerance and herbicide tolerance. So, you know, right there, the focus really is on pushing these chemicals. The interesting thing is that they will ultimately fail, and they'll have have to raise the ante. We've seen that with glyphosate, Roundup. We've seen a, an outbreak of resistant weeds that now are almost uncontrollable. And the, the answer to that was to genetically engineer seed further so that it would not only be tolerant of Roundup, but it would be tolerant of dicamba. And we've talked about the dicamba problem a couple of times. Um, well, dicamba has snowballed into this whole big controversy because you basically have a situation where it's the Hatfields and McCoys. People are really hostile about the whole subject because you have you know, one group that feels that this is the answer and another group that's basically losing everything because of dicamba drift. Well, if you buy the genetically modified seed, you can use dicamba. But if you're a farmer that hasn't paid the premium to buy that seed, you're still growing the same old uh, soybeans. That dicamba, if it drifts onto your land, is going to kill your crop and your losses are going to be huge. And that's what's happening in a dozen different states, I think. I don't know exactly what the number is. And it's the passion has risen high enough that there's actually been um, a killing involved with this controversy. What do you mean a killing? I'm saying there was a confrontation and a man was killed in, wow. an, argument, in an argument over this dicamba issue. 
I just lost my whole train of thought. I did not know that, and that's kind of blowing me away. I think it's blown everybody away. I'd like to shift gears a little bit. I'd like to talk, before we close, I'd like to talk about how these problems that we've discussed now for several years, how they're being handled. And we've been presented with a number of steps that we're told are a step in the right direction. And I'm coming to the feeling at this point that we simply cannot be satisfied with steps in the right direction because in light of the magnitude of the poisoning and the problems that we're facing, steps in the right direction are, are not going to accomplish much of anything. And I used, I was talking with a friend the other day and I used the metaphor of standing on the railroad tracks and facing an oncoming train. Now, if you step toward the side, that's a step in the right direction. That's a good move. But if you don't, if that step doesn't take you off the railroad tracks, then it's worthless. And with the neonicotinoid family alone, we're faced with an oncoming train and we're being run over. We are on the railroad tracks and as well-intentioned as they may be, these steps in the right direction are totally inadequate. We're witnessing a massive poisoning of the environment and what may be a major extinction of thousands of species. And steps in the right direction are not adequate. And we've got to do better. I'm not sure how that can even be accomplished at this point because it's not just the Trump administration. We've seen it in the Obama administration. You've experienced it pretty much all throughout your life, Tom. Every administration has done really nothing to sincerely protect the environment. It's getting much worse, though, and I think that the... Uh... We've focused on the neonicotinoids. They're not the only chemicals that are being used. There's something like 60,000 different chemicals out there that are being used for a variety of things. And then we but wonder the neo- why everybody's sick. We wonder why everybody has that well, little uh, need to clear their throats constantly. We need to face up to the fact that this neonicotinoid family is the plutonium of pesticides. And there is no safe use Whatever the reward may be, there is no safe use of this family of chemicals. And and it's time to face up to that reality and remove these from the environment. It may already be too late. We've had 20 years where massive amounts of these neonicotinoids have been put into the environment, and many of them have half-lives of years. Even if we were to stop today, it could be decades before these chemicals have removed themselves from the environment. We need to wake up. We need to wake up the regulators. We need to deal with some of these people who are making these unwise decisions. The chemical companies, the corporations are in control. We need to seize that control back. The people need to get in control here because we're on the receiving end of all this poisoning. I think within a hundred years time, we'll see the extinction of the human race. That's the direction that we're heading in. And that's not any type of conspiracy theory. That's nothing that you need a PhD for. That's common sense at the rate that we're going. With all the different things that we are bombarding the environment with, the environment that we are dependent upon to live, the water which gives us life, that's contaminated. It just doesn't make any sense. There are some fairly learned people who are making those very predictions, and uh, obviously we all hope that they're wrong, but we're, we're having such an influence on the health of the Earth that we may extinguish ourselves if we aren't careful and don't come to our senses fairly soon. Well, Tom, thanks for joining me today. We are out of time. To be continued. Yeah, it's always uplifting to talk. (laughs) thank you June and thank you to all of our listeners also 
Well, folks, if you have any questions for us, please reach out to us at questions at theorganicview.com. If you're a beekeeper and you have sustained losses due to the impact of neonicotinoids, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Tune in next week as Tom and I continue the discussion. Thank you for tuning in. This has been June Stoyer with the Organic View Radio Show. Have a great afternoon.